Good morning and welcome to Coffee with Sister Jacinta as we journey through our spiritual journey uh, through the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So let's begin today calling upon our guardian angels. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love entrusts me here, ever this day be at my side. The light to guard, to rule, and guide. From seeing the sin, will keep me free, and at my death, my help will be. Amen. And of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So today we have a title that we're going to start with, which is paragraph 391, if you are following along in your book. And this is titled with The Fall of the Angels. Behind the disobedient choice of our first parents lurks a, sedu a seductive voice opposed to God, which makes them fall into death out of envy. Scripture and the church's tradition see in this being a fallen angel called Satan or the devil. The church teaches that Satan was at first a good angel made by God. The devil and the other demons were indeed created naturally good by God, but they became evil by their own doing. Scripture speaks of a sin of these angels. This fall consists in the free choice of these created spirits who radically and irrevocably rejected God and his reign. We find a reflection of that rebellion in the tempter's words to our first parents. You will be like God. The devil has sinned from the beginning. He is a liar and the father of lies. It is the irrevocable character of their choice and not a defect in the infinite divine mercy that makes the angels' sin unforgivable. There is no repentance for the angels after their fall, just as there is no repentance for men after death. Okay, so this is an interesting feature about an angel compared to us. Angels do not have um, the ability to um, not see consequences, okay? We don't see consequences. And that's why even when we feel that we have deliberately done something, we could look back and totally regret it. Okay, because we don't have the full extent of the evil that it might procure. I mean, at a moment, our emotions are so involved and we feel like we have full understanding. And there is definitely culpability there. But the, the ability for us to revoke um, our choice while we're here on earth is, is, um, is ours, but it's not the angels because the angels could actually see the consequences of their decision. And, and, and that's so amazing is that they still were able and willing to reject God. So they had a test just as we have a test. So we have, um, we have many tests, okay. <laughs> compared to them, okay, um, because, um, again, because we have a, uh, a, a sight that doesn't see the full uh, picture. It's limited by our human nature because we have both a body and a soul, okay, and being that we're not a pure spirit, okay, it, it just is a qualification that makes us different than an angel. So, you have this first angel and you know sometimes we just go past this but um truly i think sometimes it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing just to reflect on it and and to see um again how truly god respected us when he made us like himself he gave us an intellect he gave the angels an intellect and he gave us a will and um and these and this angel okay like satan they, they believe it, like we, we say his name once was Lucifer. And, and Lucifer um, was a beautiful name. That was light. And I mean, he, he was supposed to be one of the most brilliant. And he remains brilliant. His intelligence wasn't taken from him, you know? And um, even his angelic powers are still part of who he is, um, which are higher than our abilities, okay? They're not um, subject to the same laws of nature, okay, they don't have a body, you know, but we're constricted by that body. And, yeah, you know, so, and, you know, but to, to know how close he was to God, 
And many people believe that his sense of not serving had to do with the possibility that he was allowed to see God's plan. And he was able to see that he was going to create man and become man. And that the angels would have to bow down to men because of that. And that this was so um, abhorrent okay, to Lucifer that he refused okay, to ever you know, uh, subject himself to something of this. And, um, and so it is, uh, again, our guests, we weren't there, okay? Um, but just looking at the kind of lies that he has um, and, and seeing that the very consequence of original sin tells Satan that he will have his head crushed by the woman um, who will bear the savior of the world, okay? sort of gives us an idea that perhaps this is very much speaking to the consequence of what the sin was that he committed, that he refuses, okay, to ever revoke. And God respects that will. Okay, we have a, a will also, but we'll talk about it in a minute. We're going to go to, to original sin. Um, so I'll work continually with the, with the finishing up this part here with the angels. Scripture witnesses to the dis disastrous influence of the one Jesus calls a murderer from the beginning, who would even try to divert Jesus from the mission received from his father. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. In its consequences, the gravest of these works was the menda mendacious seduction that led man to disobey God. The power of Satan is nonetheless not infinite. He's only a creature, powerful from the fact that he is a pure spirit, but he's still a creature. He cannot prevent the building of God's reign. Although Satan may act in the world out of hatred for God and his kingdom and, and God's kingdom in Christ Jesus, and although his actions may cause grave injuries of a spiritual nature and indirectly even of a physical nature to each man and to society, the action is permitted by divine providence with which with strength and gentleness guides human and cosmic history. It is a great mystery that providence should permit diabolical activity, but we know that in everything God works for good with those who love him. Okay, so it is one of, again, a mystery of God, okay, that he allows the devil still to have um, an impact on our world and directly on our Lord, okay? Tempting him in the de desert, working through um, his influence, okay, to bring about his death. And yet, you know, um, death, I shall be your death, okay, is a statement that we read in the church's prayers because Jesus, you know, by being put to death was able to conquer death and sin. But um, I was gonna mention one thing that, that hit me here. Um, Oh, okay, the, the devil is not the opposite of God. You know, sometimes we put, you know, that um, equation together in our head. No, okay, you know, he's only a creature. He's not anything compared to God. And for this reason, we do not have to fear, okay? Our human nature can tremble, okay? Because the wiles of the devil are horrible. They're insidious, okay? Um, you know, we see them, the havoc that they can create with, um, you know, needless killings and violence and okay so these are definitely um you know provoked by the devil um uh, worked by men okay uh in conjunction okay but um you know the, you know god can conquer all of that in a moment okay but he allows us to have the freedom he gives us all the graces he gives us angels to, to assist us okay but he allows us to be part of conquering the evil in this world because he's shown us the way he's won all the graces, but he allows us to be a part of it. Um, and I, I might bring this story up another time period, but okay, thinking about that, okay, like how does that, what does that mean? Like, you know, he, he gives, like he's already won it, then what are we doing, you know? And, and why, you know, how that whole idea of sharing in redemption, okay? Like 
St. Paul says he's working out his salvation, even though salvation has been won by Christ. So what does that mean? Or that he's in labor, okay, until Christ be formed in his disciples, okay? Um, you know, they, he put, they put him back in labor, you know, okay? And, and so these are beautiful ways in which we see, okay, or St. Paul says, I'm making up in my body what's lacking in the suffering of Christ. And I think that I had to borrow this story from a priest. He's from one of the states in the West. And um, he gave a talk that is <laughs> so beautiful um, on how, how you could depict this, okay, from something that happened to him in his childhood. And he was living in one of the farms um, in the West. And his uncle owned a neighboring farm. And he would listen to his mom and dad talk about his uncle who had not done very well. And um, the mortgage was up um, to be paid. Um, and you know what, he did, he did not have a need. Um, whatever the crop was or whatever the situation was, things were not going well. And so his mom and dad had finally deliberated together long into the night after he had gone to bed. And they, they decided they were going to go ahead and help pay that bill. So the next morning, um, the little boy said, you know, father at that time, okay, but uh, when he was a little boy, he said he was outside. He was doing, you know, whatever. And uh, he saw his dad. And he said, oh, his dad is going to town. I'm like, hey, dad, what are you doing? He said, well, um, we decided that we're going to go ahead and help your uncle. So we're going to go ahead and um, help pay that mortgage. And instinctively, he said, well, can, can I help? And his dad didn't laugh at this. His dad said, well, how much do you have? And the boy put his hand away. I, I have 25 cents. And his dad said, okay, are, are you willing to help out? And the little boy had to think about this. That's all he had. And, you know, he had an allowance, and, but it was his money. And, um, yeah, yeah, I want to do this. So his dad said, okay, come on, you can come down with me. So they went to the bank and his dad got to the bank and ripped up his check. And he asked the clerk for a check uh, to take out of his account because the check that he had originally written said 10,000. But he now wrote a new check and his new check said 9,999.75 cents. And he put the 25 cents with it. And he said to his son, who paid for it? We paid for it. And it was so beautiful. And because where did that 25 cents come from? That 25 cents came from his dad. You know, and yet his dad gave him that choice from something that he gave to him to be able to willingly participate in helping his uncle without, you know what I mean, um, without being coerced into it. And so this is what God does with us. And I think that's such a beautiful thing to understand. And so he's allowing us to sometimes experience suffering. And although it looks horrible um, and scary, and it is, and, and life-threatening, and um, in, in many ways, not only life-threatening, but truly taking our life, okay? Um, it, we, when we get to eternity, we'll, we'll understand we're only suffering just a taste. We're just taking a sip from the chalice, as he told um, St. Peter, no, St. John and St. Uh, James, you know, can you drink of the chalice from which I'm going to drink? And when they said yes, he said, you will drink. When he says this to each of us, when we're faithfully following him, that we will taste of his chalice, but we have to be knowing that truly he has taken um, the greatness, the, 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 the full, um, content of it and just given us a little sip so we have part of that dignity. So now we go to original sin and this is where we're going to see um, our use of our freedom, okay, to choose to say yes or no to choices because God, again, doesn't just hand us heaven, he allows us to participate in saying yes to it, into that victory. Um, so we have freedom put to the test. God created man in his image and established him in his friendship. A spiritual creature, man, can live this friendship only in free submission to God. 
the prohibition against eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil spells this out. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil symbolically evokes these insurmountable limits that man, being a creature, must freely recognize and respect with trust. Man is dependent on his creator and subject to the laws of creation and to the moral norms that govern the use of freedom. Man's first sin. Man, tempted by the devil, let his trust in his creator die in his heart and abusing his freedom, disobeyed God's command. This is what man's first sin consisted of. All subsequent sin would be disobedience towards God and a lack of trust in his goodness. In that sin, man preferred himself to God and by the very act scorned him. He chose himself over and against God, against the requirements of his creaturely status and therefore against his own good, constituted in a state of holiness. Man was destined to be fully divinized by God in glory. Seduced by the devil, he wanted to be like God, but without God before him and not in accordance with God. So scripture portrays the tragic consequence of this first disobedience. Adam and Eve immediately lose the grace of original holiness. They become afraid of God, of whom they had conceived a distorted image, that of a God jealous of his prerogatives. And so you know, this is something that is so sad. I mean, and again, we sometimes are just so used to it that we don't think about it. But imagine it being um, a, a mom or dad or an aunt or a grandparent who's always just been so um prodigal okay in the sense of just generous okay to your child to your niece your nephew your grandchild um always show them goodwill um treated them with such dignity and then someone comes along and distorts that picture and suddenly they don't trust you and, and you've done nothing, okay? But someone's decided to badmouth you and say that you're a selfish person, that you don't ever want to actually give them the fullness of what they really could be. They could be, you know, um, whatever, you know what I mean? And um, how much it breaks your heart to see someone whom you've only had goodwill towards, whom you've been utterly generous to, to suddenly turn and distrust you because of what another has said. And this is what happens, okay, with original sin. You know, we, we have the story of the, the tree, you know, um, of good and evil. And then we have Adam and Eve. And, you know, we have the story that Eve was close to that tree and the, the devil disguised himself in the, in the form of a serpent. And, and, you know, and she looks at it the fruit okay and and sees it as good and 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 buys into this lie of distrusting god that oh he wants to keep you from being like him you know um because then you'll know all things and again like so then you get away from the god who will make you and, and giving you everything and help back nothing you know and you know so for no reason at all but to do the distortion of the devil okay and so Eve eats of it, and then she gives it to her husband, who was near her, okay? Which is interesting, okay? Like, I remember I always thought he was somewhere else in the garden and that she deceived him. But actually, he was right beside her, okay? When you read scripture, I, I don't have the, I mean, bring it actually in front of me. And I don't know. No, they don't have the actual writing of how that took place here in the catechism. But, um, this really um, amazed me, and I think that, um, you know, there's been some beautiful reflection on the fact of where Adam and Eve, you know, sinned against the characters of, of or the, the, their own nature, because Eve of herself is supposed to lead, lead her husband, okay, lead towards good, you know, in a relationship, the woman often leads the man, you know, when I was listening to a, a friend of mine, you know, when he started uh, dating his wife, you know, 
she, um, they were going out to some movie and so he, he picked her up and they were getting in the car and he's in the driver's seat and well, where is she? She's waiting in the driveway. And suddenly he realizes, oh, so he gets out of the car and he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I was so excited about going out that I just totally forgot my manners. And he opened the door for her and then let her in and close the door. And by doing this, okay, she was able to draw out some qualities, okay, of respect uh, within that relationship that he kept all his, his life, okay, when he, after he married her too. And, and so she can lead, lead to certain manly virtues, okay. But he is supposed to be a protector, and he allowed her to be tempted by the serpent and to listen to the serpent. And so it was, it's beautiful to see, okay, that in the end, he was supposed to protect him. And the, so you have the sin, okay, the original sin. Um, and, you know, it, it's called Adam's sin because he is the, um, the one who gen generates mankind, okay? Um, and so he passes on this sin. So again, you see that though, that they both failed, okay, in their roles. And, and this is the beautiful dignity that is given to us and that we need to be able to continue to strengthen due to the fact that now we all have a weakened nature. Okay, so it continues. Um, scripture portrayed the tragic consequences of the first disobedience, Adam and Eve, immediately lose the grace of original holiness. They become afraid of God, of whom they had conceived a distorted image, that of a God jealous of his prerogatives. The harmony in which they had found themselves, thanks to original justice, is now destroyed. The control of the soul's spiritual faculties over the body is shattered. The union of man and woman becomes subject, subject to tensions. The relations henceforth marked by lust and domination. Harmony with creation is broken. Visible creation has become alien and hostile to man. Because of man, creation is now subject to the bondage to decay. Finally, consequence explicitly foretold, for this disobedience will come true. Man will return to the ground, for out of it he was taken. Death makes its entrance into human history. And more than just even the mortal death of the body is the death of the soul. No longer does God's life live within them. Okay? they have now become uh, lacking that friendship of God. The God never abandons us. So we read, after the first sin, the world is virtually inundated by sin. There's Cain's murder and his brother Abel and the universal corruption which follows um, in the wake of sin. Likewise, sin frequently manifests itself in the history of Israel, especially as infinitely I'm sorry, as infidelity to God or the covenant and other transgression of the law of Moses. And even after Christ's atonement, sin raises its head in countless ways among Christians. Scripture and the church tradition continually recall the presence and universality of sin in man's history. What Revelation makes known to us is conformed by our own experience. For when man looks into his own heart, he finds that he is drawn towards what is wrong and sunk in many evils, which cannot come from his own, cre his own good creator. Often refusing to acknowledge God as his source, man has also upset the relationship which should link him to his last end. And at the same time, he has broken the right order that should reign within himself, as well as between himself and other men and all creatures. Um, if you are into watching movies, there is a sight and sound, okay, that was done in the theaters in Pennsylvania that's now been put into um, a recording of a DVD, and it's called The Beginning, and it goes over the creation of the world, and then the creating of man and Adam and Eve, and, and then the fall of Adam and Eve, and then it it continues even with uh, the sin of, of Cain killing Abel. Um, it is extremely well done. So if you have an opportunity to uh, rent it or to buy it and, and to be able to watch this, 
again, this is a beautiful accounting of um, the beauty of the world that God made, the harmony, and, and then the devastating effects of original sin. And, and seeing its consequences passed on, okay, to the gener to all of us, okay, and, and the coming different forms. Okay, the consequence of Adam's sin for humanity. All men are implicated in Adam's sin, as St. Paul affirms. By one man's disobedience, many, that is, all men were made sinners. Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all men sinned. The apostle contrasts the universality of sin and death with the universality of salvation in Christ. Then, as one man trespass led to condemnation for all men, the one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. Okay, so this is the beauty, okay? Um, that sometimes Jesus is called the new Adam. Following St. Paul, the church has always taught that the overwhelming misery which oppresses men and their inclination toward evil and death cannot be understood apart from the connection with Adam's sin and the fact that he has transmitted to us a sin with which we are all born afflicted, a sin which is the death of the soul. Because of this certain of faith, the church baptizes for the remission of sins, even tiny infants who have not committed personal sin. Okay, but you know, if I was given a million dollars and I lost the million dollars, I cannot give that million dollars to the next person. So, this natural friendship with God, okay, was broken by Adam and Eve, and he can't pass it on, okay. It's one that has to be continually brought back through the remission of our sin through baptism. Because our Lord gave that as our means. When he was leaving this world, he told his disciples, baptize um, men in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, this is what his whole mission was. Okay, the moment he rises from the dead, okay, he says, Peace be with you, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven, whose sins you hold down are held down. Okay, so immediately he wished to usher in this grace. Okay, but this is the gift of Christ. Okay, it's not the gift of Adam and Eve, so they can't pass it on. But Christ, he never wants to withhold it from us. Okay, and so. We don't have to withhold it from infants, okay? It is a gift of friendship, of life, of, of, of God's life in our soul. And we don't want to hold that off until a person is older, like from the moment that they are born. <laughs> but again, the church also wants to see that that can actually be nurtured, okay? And not um, wasted and, and, and trampled upon. So there's definitely a desire to be able to see that that baptism will be um, brought to its fruition, okay, by us coming to know, love, and serve our Lord. So how did the sin of Adam become the sin of all his descendants? The whole human race is in Adam as one body of one man. By this unity of the human race, all men are implicated in Adam's sin as all are implicated in Christ's justice. Still, the transmission of original sin is a mystery that we cannot fully understand. But we do know by revelation that Adam had received original holiness and justice not for himself alone, but for all human nature. By yielding to the tempter, Adam and Eve committed a personal sin, but this sin affected the human nature that they would then transmit to a fallen state, in a fallen state. It is a sin which will be transmitted by propagation um, to all mankind. That is, by the transmission of human nature deprived of original holiness and justice. And that's why original sin is called sin only in the anagogical sense. It is a sin contracted and not committed, a state and not an act. Okay, And I think that's important because when we are born with uh, original sin, is that we don't have God's life in us, okay? Because this was given to us through the new Adam, okay? Through Christ. And so when we talk about sin, okay? Being born in the state of original sin is the consequences, okay? They lost 
the grace of friendship, okay? And so this takes them out of friendship with Christ, okay? Now, that was their personal sin. It's not my personal sin. It's not your personal sin. Those personal sins are our choices, okay, to say no to God. Um, but just as we said, they couldn't pass on original justice to us. They couldn't pass on the friendship of God, okay? That comes through Christ. Um, and so in this sense, okay, that's, that's um, what we're talking about when we talk about original sin. It's not our personal sin, but we are given the state, okay, of the consequences of that first personal sin of Adam and Eve, because from them, all mankind comes, okay? And so in one sense, we're all present, okay, in that sense, in Adam and Eve, okay? Um, Okay, so although it is proper to each individual, original sin does not have the character of a personal fault in any of Adam's descendants. It is deprivation of original holiness and justice. But human nature has not been totally corrupted. It is wounded in the natural powers proper to it, subject to ignorance, suffering, and domination of death, and inclined to sin, an inclination to evil that's called concupiscence. Baptism, by imparting the life of Christ's grace, erases original sin and turns a man back toward God. But the consequences for nature, weaken and inclined to evil, persist in man and summon him to a spiritual battle. All right, and um, you know, last week we talked about the fact that God made man, okay? Um, he made male and female, okay? And in today's world, we see a lot of confusion, okay? Um, and this is all due to the fact of Adam and Eve sinning, okay? But as we learn, okay, concupiscence, okay, is an inclination, okay? We are given the ability, okay, not to um, yield, okay? to this idea of passion over reason, okay? The reason has to always be the one in charge. And so um, we don't follow inclination. Like I said, just because I'm inclined to want to drive through all the red lights, okay? I don't feel like stopping, okay? Um, you know, that would not be intelligent, okay? <laughs> that would not be using my my, uh, ability to reason, which would say, you know, the likelihood of me getting into an accident, either causing my own death or someone else's death or both, um, is very real. And, and so, you know, I have to say I had to be more true to myself by being true to my reason. Okay, so the church's teaching on the transmission of original sin was articulated more precisely in the fifth century especially under the impulse of St. Augustine's reflections against Pelagianism, and in the 16th century in opposition to the Protestant Reformation. Pelagius held that man could, by the natural power of free will and without the necessary help of God's grace, lead a morally good life. He thus reduced the influence of Adam's fault to a bad example. The first Protestant reformers, on the contrary, taught that original sin was has radically perverted man and destroyed his freedom and they identified the sin inherited by each man with the tendency to evil concupiscential which would be insurmountable the church pronounced on the meaning of the data of revelation on original sin especially at the second council of orange and at the council of trent okay so that you can't have us able to earn our way to heaven without the grace of God, okay? Which would be Pelagius, okay? And um, when we get baptized, our sin is not still there. We still have weaknesses, okay? But the sin is completely eradicated and the ability to be in friendship of God is completely given to us. Um, okay, it's not a covering over of dirt, okay? It's the withdrawal of it all. And so, um, you know, we can't have either extreme. And so this is what the teaching of the church is concerning um, original sin and also the, in the light of um, the baptism. And again, we'll be doing more with that as we go through, but we're going to have to close here. So let us um, close with a prayer to St. Michael to help us 
to surmount the difficulties that result from the impact of concupiscence and from the evil of the world and um, of the devil. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray, and do thou. O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.